Good morning. <clears throat> Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as we gather for worship and uh, we are uh, happy that things are coming back to normal. We had our first uh, Sunday school indoors uh, Sunday and we're very pleased with parental support, with teachers and with uh, the, certainly the children that God is bringing us. And uh, we welcome uh, our folks out on the internet as well. And we would say to you that this is the time when things are happening at Martini Lutheran Church, your church in many cases. And uh, please be here in person. If you're going to be doing anything else outside the house today, please make sure you're in God's house first. Perfect way to start your week, as well as to bring the blessing that God actually invented church to do. We have a few things by way of announcement. First of all, in our prayers, we have a number of prayer requests. Uh, too late for the bulletin. Uh, we pray for uh, the family of Vernon Brown, a uh, friend to uh, uh, Erica Windsor. Uh, we pray for Donna Holt, and uh, she is doing some doctoring. We ask God's blessing upon her. We pray for the family of Herbert Weaver, um, who is father to Ronnie's niece. Is that right? Okay. Who passed away. A few other things by way of announcement. After church today, there will be fellowship. Well, those who are taking care of today's fellowship are known as the ones who put on the grandest fellowship. And we appreciate that. And if you want to compete with them and try to make yours even grander, we'll take that because we all benefit. But maybe you'd look at that and say, well, we can't do something that great. We won't sign up. And friends, after COVID, there have been some changes, some for medical reasons, some for other reasons, some for moving reasons. And, uh, and we need a few slots filled. And I'm seeing Paige Moffat sitting right here, and she has been very good to keep this list. And uh, there, there may be some transition in that, but in serving faithfully, she's looking for those who say, once, and we're trying to do it once every two months. We don't want it to be a grind, like, oh, every third Sunday or something like that. Once every two months. And that also means there are enough people, if you're in a pinch, you can switch with somebody. It still won't be hard. Um, all we, what we ask is uh, maybe a cake or something that you could bring uh, that would be uh, pleasant with coffee um, to provide or to make. We actually provide the coffee if you make it. And then just to clean up afterwards, uh, it would be a gift, a dedication. It's why we ask you to sign up. But uh, see Paige after church today if you could be one of those people. We just need a few more and perhaps you may be one of those people. Also, um, our, our van is running right now for Sunday school students. And uh, so we are happy to have uh, that coming back. We will soon be opening it up to the whole congregation, but we are just getting started. We want to make sure that things are comfortable for everyone. And the van after sitting has a few mechanical things we need to work out too. So we're asking if, if you're a Sunday school student or, or parent, we think that we're in good shape, but if we have to take it out of service for some reason, uh, we want to let you know and just let that small group know and maybe arrange rides as necessary. Uh, also, um, let me just see here for a minute. I have one other. Th oh, next week, Bob Keck asks if I would uh, make mention to all people involved with Vacation Bible School. Uh, he's been leading this for um, nearly a quarter of a century among us now. And uh, so we uh, will have a meeting after church. It will be a startup meeting. Uh, please come for any or all of it as you're able. And this would be teachers. It would be teachers' helpers. And it would also be those fulfilling other things, uh, such as the kitchen, recess, and uh, other parts besides the classroom itself, crafts and others. So those are my announcements to you. Are there other announcements uh, from the president? All right. We are happy to have hymns by request. We try to remember that they are requests by putting an asterisk by them. And uh, when we do this, it allows us to sing favorite hymns, which speak to our spirit, but also uh, to let the pastor know what the congregation likes. And uh, that always helps and guides me on the parts of the months where I'm picking hymns to know what is within the mainstream. So God bless your worship. Our opening hymn, hymn 770, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy.
be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Our catechism today is the third and fourth commandments uh, found on page 321 in the front of your hymnal. What is the third commandment? What does this mean? We should fear and love God. We do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn. What is the fourth commandment? What does this mean? Fear and love God, so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Our first reading this uh, seventh Sunday after Pentecost from the seventh chapter of Amos, beginning at the seventh verse. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear his words. For thus Amos had said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of his kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. Our second reading from the first chapter of Ephesians, beginning at the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, were sealed uh, with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel forming the basis of our sermon from the sixth chapter of Mark, beginning at the 14th verse. <clears throat> 
King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had been known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders, the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, She pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent out an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, congregation may be seated. We invite our children forward for a children's talk. Thank you for helping lead people forward. And I see here comes Ava and here comes Dakota. Dakota, I think we've got a front seat for you right here. Oh, you bet. Good morning. And it's good to see you all. Can you turn around and face me? Because I want to see your pretty face. Thank you. In our second lesson today, the scripture says that God has blessed us with every spiritual gift. Now, if we were talking about other gifts, wouldn't it be cool that every single thing you wanted and needed, you got given for your birthday or Christmas? That's if they were like physical gifts. So what does the Bible mean when it says that it has for Sarah and Dakota and Ava every spiritual gift in the heavenly places? Well, when God gives you his gifts, first of all, he gave you his love. That's one of his spiritual gifts, to love you. Even though we've done some things wrong, which we call sins, he loves you. And then here's something else. He gave you the Bible. You all were in Sunday school, weren't you? You too. You all were in Sunday school, and you heard his word. So God gave you his word. Let's see what else. God gave you church, and here we are together. We wouldn't see each other. You two would see each other. But as a group, we would not see each other this week if it weren't for church. So he gives us all these gifts. When you go home, you'll still have his word. And he gives you prayer, something we enjoy here. And so when he gives us prayer, that's part of the gifts too. 
he gives us his guidance and heaven one day. So, <clears throat> pardon me, you have been blessed with every spiritual gift. And I want you to know that when you go out this week, don't feel like, oh, I can't. Feel like, I have a God who sent his son, Jesus, and Jesus died for me. And if he loves me that much, he'll hear me when I pray. He'll guide me when I need his help. He'll be strong for me when I feel weak. And he's promised me all his love and forgiveness. So I just want you to know you have all of the spiritual things you need. And I'm happy about that. And now because I'm happy and you've heard it, I'm going to send you back to your seat so we can sing and hear the word and pray. Go ahead back and we'll continue with our sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, our, uh, our text today is from the Gospel, and it is the 26th verse where we read these words. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and guests, he does not want to break his word to her. Here ends the reading of our text, and you may be seated. 
Friends, as you'll notice, the, uh, the title of today's sermon is The Secular World Deals with Jesus. And you might look and say, well, yes, of course, the secular world does deal with Jesus. But one of the things that you would also say is, if the text is our gospel, it appears that if the secular world is represented by Herod, which it is, that he is dealing with John the Baptist, not so much Jesus. But then we understand some things as well. And one is, to deal with God's prophet is to deal with God. And so when John is the prophet of God, Herod, the secular king, is dealing with God. When he is the prophet, which is the forerunner of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the secular world of Herod and Herodias and all the people of his court deal with Jesus because this is uh, St. John uh, the Baptist. Now we'll say a couple things about this text. Some of you are familiar with this text and you'll say, oh, that's right, the girl that danced, that's Salome. Well, in the scripture, we're not given her name. There is in the historical uh, account of Flavius Josephus, uh, a rather reliable uh, Jewish historian of the time, uh, he says that Salome is the daughter that Herodias had uh, by uh, Herod Philip, whom, of course, uh, they divorced, and then uh, Herod uh, Antipas, the Herod of our story, uh, marries uh, Herodias. There could have been other daughters, and one was named Salome, but this is a pretty good um, attestation. However, then you might say, oh, we recall she danced the dance of the seven veils. Well, that's unknown to scripture or history, uh, but it's known to Oscar Wilde, the playwright of the 1800, who needed to somehow put some artistic license with this uh, to get the point across as he saw it. And then if I were to say to you, oh, we have a trivia question of what was the platter made? If you go with the scripture, you would say, we don't know. If you go back to Oscar Wilde again, you say, oh, it was silver, okay. And so people since Wilde have actually taken this and enshrined certain things into our, what we think is our remembrance of the story. And we, as those who want to stick with what God's word has told us, uh, it's good to dis disambiguate those things. We talk about the secular world dealing with uh, Jesus, and the secular world is seen in three ways. And what we're going to do in this sermon is we're going to shine it on one part of this, then another part, then we might return to one part, but here are the three parts we're going to shine the light on. One is the God-respecting secular world. Herod, for instance. He is God-respecting. We'll talk about that in a minute. Second of all, the God-disrespecting world, and that would be Herodias, uh, his wife, and then the silent many people who don't speak up to respect or disrespect, and that would be Herod's entire court. If you'd like to see these as typifying different ones of the secular world, of the non-believing world, uh, there you go. And so one of the things that happens is this. They have a prophet in their midst. And what a prophet does is this. He says to them, which side are you on? He doesn't necessarily ever use those words. But when he puts forth the word of God as God says it, that's what's going on. Most people would say a prophet is someone who foretells, that is, tells the future. And that is so, as God gives things for that prophet to foretell. But the main job of the prophet, actually, is to foretell, to tell forth. To say, here's what is, and here's what God thinks of you and of what's happening. And here's what God's going to do about it. That's what we were hearing from Amos, for instance. Here's what God's going to do. And then the prophet, if he's a prophet who's any good, who's a faithful prophet, will do as Amos did when they said, prophet, go preach somewhere else. Go back home and preach. And Amos in those last verses says, I was not a prophet here. I was at home minding my business and I was, uh, let's say, dressing figs and leading sheep and such. And God called me to be a prophet and sent me here. So the reason I'm here is not because you tell me to come or go, it's because God told me to come. And the implication there is God couldn't find a prophet in their land and had to import one so that they'd hear the truth. And in fact, the prophets of that time uh, were indeed saying what the king wanted to be said. Herod had a similar court, and we can talk about that another time. Uh, Herod, by the way, among you, you call me to be a prophet. That's why I say uh, cantankerous things like, if any of you are watching out in internet land, if you're going to be doing something else outside the house today, you really belong in church, right? Because it's important to put that forth, that God says, not I have an opinion or I'm on a trip of some kind of getting people to do what I want. Unless you want and I want the will of God, we are not agreed. 
But if we both want the will of God, we are agreed. If God sets a prophet in your midst, the prophet lays it out there, and the chips fall where they may. And God goes to work through his word, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. Or remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And we even went through the meaning today. It's important that there is a congregation for that prophet who will hear him as such. They will simply say, well, I didn't really like hearing what I heard, but I know it's from the scripture. I know it's from the mouth of God. And if it's not, to take the prophet aside and let him know that it's important that he shows where this is from so as to be sure. Herod is a secular God respecter. What I mean by that is, in context, you know, he, he had this birthday feast, which was likely a drunken feast. But in the doing, he shows certain things where he did respect God. We're told about how he uh, was sorry that he was going to kill John the Baptist. Now that sounds funny because he is going to kill him. But the fact of the matter is, we're told he was his protector. Herodias, once John the Baptist had said, it's not right for Herod to take her as his wife. Well, Herodias had a grudge against him, and she was going to see that John the Baptist was canceled. But in the meantime, what happens is, Herod is his protector. We're told he would listen to John the Baptist. And we're assuming listen to him preach, or go down and talk with him, or whatever the case was. And we believe this happens at a palace, which the archaeologists have discovered, over in what is now the country of Jordan, east of the Jordan River. Be that as it may, as he would do this, he would be perplexed, the scripture says. Why perplexed? Because he was hearing something that he knew was so. And he also knew he wasn't involved in doing and upholding what he knew was so. And the second thing is, he respected him because he was holy and righteous. So Herod enjoyed to hear the truth, but then still didn't want to live by it. But he still had respect for the prophet, and therefore respect for God because he was a holy and righteous man, and he was John's protector against anyone else, including his own wife, who wanted to kill John the Baptist. Now, Herodias was a different story. Herodias is angry. No woman wants to be held up in public as being the kind of woman who has loose morals. And in the doing, she is upset and wants him silenced. And since she happens to be married to the king, she figures this should be able to be done, except he doesn't want it, and he won't do it. And so she waits for an opportunity, and sure enough, the scripture tells us, an opportunity came. Assuming here that the party is a pretty wild party, and it's a birthday feast, as, as the um, original language would tell us, uh, one of the things that we understand is that Herodias notices that it's time, and where the word for um, uh, Salome, we assume, for the daughter, uh, coming in is she leaps into the middle. There's a way she sort of intrudes or simply comes into the middle and draws attention and then does this dance. And we're told that the dance pleased Herod. Herod is not thinking well when he says, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom for this. So he must have been quite pleased. And that's all he could think of. And so when he does this, she goes to her mother. We assume that she goes to her mother for two reasons. One is she is either very dependent on her anyway. That does say she's a girl. The second thing is, it could be her mother put her up to it. But one way or the other, when Herod makes that promise, she's got it. And there are all these witnesses. The king, a mighty man, a respectable man in society. He's made a promise. And there's all the witnesses. And it's a family promise. It's a kingdom promise. And if he would go against his own family, then all of these dukes and nobles, whatever else, what have you there at the party, realize well, he'll go against us too. And so once she comes in and says, at once, the head of John the Baptist on a platter, well, then he is exceedingly sorry because he's a God respecter. But the God respect kind of leaves there, and he immediately sends out a person to kill John the Baptist. Herodias is happy about it. She's glad to finally get what she wants. She's the secular God disrespecter. In your life, you are surrounded by one or the other. If you are not surrounded by believers, then you have those who don't believe God, but believe that it's good to believe in God for those who want to. And then you have those who don't believe in God, and they are truly against his agenda, his worldview, his book, his son, his people. And that's simply what we are seeing in our own society to this day. Back to Herod again. Herod cared about his own word, 
But when it came to God's word saying otherwise, he would not choose God's word over his. It's why we say he is a secular God respecter. In the end, he is secular. He cared about how his acclaim would be, not what God's acclaim would be. And all through this week, you will be tempted by the same thing. When you make a mistake, when you commit a sin, when you speak unguardedly, then will be your chance either to stand your ground and be wrong and not care before God, but be okay with your fellow man. Or to say, wait a minute, I didn't mean that. Here's what I really mean. And to completely reverse yourself that you might have the acclaim of God, even if the acclaim of other people vanishes when you do that. So it is when the secular world deals with Jesus. And because you bear the mark of Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, then when the secular world is dealing with God, they're also dealing with his people. When they deal with God in the flesh, they also deal with you in the flesh and will do so in the same way. The point is, secular is secular, isn't it? In the end, secular will not say, oh, this person, I I guess I do respect God, I'll suddenly be a changed person. They simply go ahead and in the end show themselves to be the secular one they are, unless God by his Holy Spirit converts them through the gospel and makes them a new creature in Christ. That's simply how it is. Secular is secular, no matter how God respecting or how God non-respecting. It's why, for instance, that your favorite politician whom you elected because they seem to be God respecting will compromise on every God respecting issue because he's actually or she is actually secular. Or it's why the politician who is your favorite will stand up on every God respecting issue because that person is not secular, but they are a believer. That's when it comes to tell the difference between the secular and the sacred. Oh, and the spotlight is on the silent crowd as well. Because of all the good people, the good citizens, who may in the eyes of God be believers or non-believers, who all say nothing. There are non-believers that say nothing. There are believers that say nothing. And when that happens, you help create and push forward a secular world, a world that will ultimately dishonor God. I'll tell you a little bit further about the story of Herodias and Herod skipping toward the ends of their lives. You know, um, Herodias got what she wanted. She got John the Baptist's head on a platter. And she got to win out over her husband, too. Yay for Herodias, see. But what actually happened in their lives? Later, her husband would get on the wrong side of Caesar. One of the Caesars, and this is all within about seven years of this happening. There was a Caesar Tiberius. Herod wanted to get in good with him. Herod built a city on the west shore of Galilee called Tiberius. In the scripture even, the Sea of Galilee is referred to as the Sea of Tiberius in a place or two. And in the doing of all that, he and Tiberius were really great. But now comes up something from the past. You recall that Herod married Herodias, but Herod had a wife before he did that. And he got interested in Herodias, or Herodias set her sights on him. One way or the other, they believed they were in true love, and Herod put away his first wife. He divorced her. And what happened was this, because these things do come around. What happens is this. The wife he had married was the daughter of a king of a nearby kingdom. And so what happened is, her father, the king, who's a neighbor to Herod, never forgot that. This was not part of the Jewish state, but this was part of the border going the other way. And their father never forgot that. And one day he picked a border fight. And that border fight, Herod mustered army against it, but it was very costly to Herod. And because Herod was the king over a Roman portion, namely Galilee and Perea on the east side of the the Jordan, and it cost him so much and made Rome look bad, he fell out of favor with Tiberius Caesar. And when he did, Tiberius Caesar and he were on the outs, and then Tiberius dies pretty quick after that. And at that time, Herod's nephew, who would love to be king, named Agrippa I, he says to himself, this is the perfect time to get rid of old Uncle Herod. And so he complains to the present Caesar, whose name, by the way, is the actual Caligula, and he complains to him, and Caligula doesn't like all this petty stuff going on, he just wants it stopped. So he uproots Herod and Herodias and exiles them to Gaul, uh, basically to a portion of Spain in this case. And so they are now in exile out in Siberia, so to speak, 
in Gaul. And all that they had worked for, Herod doing his thing, throwing his parties, having his palace, and Herodias who got her way with John the Baptist, it's all for naught. They're there starting in 37 AD. He dies a year and a half later out there, and she is there all alone, and she would be, let's see, in 37 AD, she's born in 15 BC. She's about 52 years old, and she's alone in the world. And that is the end of Herod and Herodias, the secular people who did not look to God. Herod, who loved to hear John preach, of course, killed John. And then Herod ended up seeing someone else. He saw the one whom John had prophesied. You may recall from the Gospel of Luke and our reading of the Passion History on the Wednesdays in Lent, that when Pontius Pilate hears that Jesus is from Galilee, that's part of Herod's realm. And so Pontius Pilate says, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't think Jesus is guilty, but I'm in a spot here. And so he sends him to Herod. And Herod is interested in seeing Jesus. He was curious about him, and he wanted to see a miracle. That's what the scripture tells us. He was looking for some sign from Jesus. Wouldn't it be neat to be there and watch Jesus do tricks? And he starts questioning Jesus because it is a trial sort of thing. And Jesus won't answer him and it makes him mad. And before things are over, Jesus does no miracle. Jesus won't speak to him. And so Herod and the soldiers mock him, and then they put ironically splendid clothing on him and cart him back to Pilate. We read the two of those, Pilate and Herod, became fast friends. Unfortunately, they became fast friends based on their uh, selling Jesus out. But what Herod ended up doing was to give Pilate cover. In all the next verses, we're reading how Pilate says, look, your King Herod didn't see anything wrong. Why should I convict him? In the end, Pilate, with the spine of a worm, uh, decides to crucify Jesus anyway. Well, where does this all go for? Jesus, who stood in front of Herod that day, whose forerunner had stood in front of Herod, but then was killed by Herod, Jesus will die for Herod. Jesus will die for Pilate. Jesus will die for Herodias, for Salome. Jesus will die for that whole court who said nothing, just as surely as Jesus died for you and for me and for a world that God so loved. Jesus will do this because that's who he is. Jesus will do this because he had a message from, through John, telling about him. And when he came, he became the message, the word made flesh. And so friends, you cannot walk in the unbelieving world when you have a Lord who gave himself for you and act secular. You cannot walk in the unbelieving world and be secular. You will either be believing or unbelieving. You will either be sacred or sanctified, but you cannot be on the fence even when it comes time for the judging of the living and the dead. There is heaven, there is hell. There is no place called fence to be on. You'll be one or the other in life, in death, and standing before God. But when you consider Jesus, who would stand before Pilate and stand before Herod and allow himself to be the lamb sacrificed for your sins and mine, well, something happens. Something happens when the Lord of heaven and earth gives his whole self up for you. When he becomes humble before a world that would indeed kill him because it is indeed sinful and secular. And when you learn of that and hear of a Lord so great, something happens. You no longer just have an objective story. When you hear he did it for you, there is a relationship to be had. And the relationship will be one of embrace, his embrace of you, and you're constantly knowing of his love and going back to him for more. Or it will be a relationship of rejection, which Herod did when he sold Jesus out as well. You would think that he had chance for redemption when he thought, I sold out John the Baptist and I didn't want to. Maybe now that I'm seeing the one he prophesied. In fact, he speculated superstitiously that this might be John the Baptist raised from the dead. Now's my chance for redemption. This time I'll see he's protected and I won't give in. And by that time he's saying, I guess I did it for John the Baptist. Might as well do it for Jesus. I, I'm me, they're them. And sure enough, he did it his way. The Lord of creation humbled himself before you. The Lord of life sacrificed himself for you. 
And as a result, there is either faith or there is unbelief. He is either your Lord or you are your Lord. Either it's him in charge or you trying to run it. And if you are, you know you'll spend your life constantly worried about what your nobles and dukes and what your peeps think of you. And if you worry about what people outside think instead of the one whose temple you are thinks, you'll get it wrong every time. Jesus came. He lived a life of significance, didn't he? He lived a life that changed the world. He lived a life that every continent that is populated on the earth gives worship to this Sunday. Jesus in significance came solely to give us a significance of being beloved, of being forgiven, of being our guide, of preparing heaven, every spiritual gift in the heavenly places. You know why Herod and Herodias have significance? Only because they sold Jesus out, they were doing their thing, and just let him pass through and pass by. We would know nothing about them if it weren't for Jesus. They would be another blip of partying, uh, unfaithful royalty that made TMZ back in the day, and now we can't even find the file tape. But because the salvation of the world was involved, the tragedy of Herod and Herodias is that they had the Lord of life, his forerunner and prophet as well, in their dwelling, in their building, in their home. And they did nothing. And started secular and finished secular. Friends, you and I who started in sin, we thank God he's brought us here and given us significance of salvation through his death on the cross. The secular world only wishes to respect Jesus enough to use him to their ends. But in the sacred side, those whom Jesus meets find their desire is that he might use us today, this week, and for a life continuing to be lived for his purpose and his glory. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
be something we do together before God here, or maybe in the fellowship hall, or at a congregational meeting, when there's especially good news to report, or whatever. So let's be patient about this, but I hope you'll go along with uh, this and help it be something we share at this time. pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We thank you for a prophet like John the Baptist. We thank you that all prophecy centers in Christ our Savior, the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, King of all. Bless us, Lord Jesus, in our walk with you. Allow your word to come to us and do whatever needs to happen that we may not ask prophets to go back to their own country as Amos of old was asked, but that we may welcome your word and seek to live for you being drawn closer, being cleansed, being allowed by your Holy Spirit to find rejuvenation, regeneration, and all things needed for life. Lord, in your mercy. Be we pray with all who are in any need, be with those who celebrate, be with those who are in homebound, be with those who are sick. And we remember, especially this day, O oh Lord, uh, Donna Holt, Ronnie Bresnick, uh, John Jackson. We remember John O'Neill Jr., Sharon Schweitzer, Sean Austin, uh, Brenda Snyder, Julia and uh, James Wright, Melita uh, Peterson, uh, Robert Ham. And friends, I am sorry to say this, but two people handed me names, and one is, is it Vernon uh, Brown? And I am missing the others, the family of uh, Ronnie's niece's husband, Mr. Weaver. We continue in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we name these before you, so that those whom you named in baptism may be properly commended by us into your care. We ask, O Lord, for those who do not yet know you, but come to you in sickness and in need. And we ask for their salvation. And we ask, dear Lord, for a relationship which begins now and lasts for eternity. We ask also that you would be with the family of Bud Randall and help others who are in need. 
uh, the Gallo family, uh, Sandra O'Neill, and the Bono family. And we ask, the, and Harriet Jackson as she recuperates, be with each one and grant them your guidance, uh, your blessing. Be with our police, our fire department, our military and their families. Thank you for their service, O Lord. Bless our society through them and allow that we respond in such a way the society which is God glorifying and God honoring in its actions uh, may continue and may further result. Be with our missionaries, uh, John Wolfe and Deaconess Kate Phillips, and be with your persecuted church wherever it is found around the world. We give you this, O Lord, and all things, in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.